بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praises due to Allah and the peace and blessing be upon his final messenger Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Whoever is guided by Allah none can send astray and whoever is sent astray by Allah none can guide We bear witness that is none who is worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we bear witness that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is his servant and last messenger. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to a new episode of your weekly program. I'm glad at the beginning of this program to welcome our guest for tonight, Dr. Dakir Abdul Karim Naik, the president of the Islamic Research Foundation in Mumbai, India. Dr. Dakir, welcome to the program and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you for being with us today. Brothers and sisters, as we know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a universal message. He sent him as the seal of the prophets, not to a particular nation, not to a particular region, but he sent him for all mankind and to all regions of the world. One of the countries that Islam has spread in is India. We have a big number of Muslims in that country and we have different cities and different regions of that country, the majority of which are Muslims. About this subject, about Islam in India, we will talk inshallah with Dr. Dakir Abdul Karim. Dr. Dakir, first we'd like to start about Islam in India in general, in the present time. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahabi ajmain, amma abad, rabbi shuhli sadri, wa yisilli amri, wa halul ugdatum min lisani yafqahu kawli. Regarding Islam in India, as the history tells us, that Alhamdulillah, the Muslims in India previously, they were on top of the world. And we have the examples of Muslims that ruled India for about a thousand years. The Mughals and India was the country which was on top of the world at that time. Mm -hmm. But today we look up to the other Western countries like America, etc. India was far superior. And at that time, Alhamdulillah, the Muslims were in power. Yes. And today, Alhamdulillah, Muslims today in India are approximately 180 million. 180 it million. million. It is the second country which has the largest number of Muslims. Number one is Indonesia, and she which claims to have 200 million Muslims. India is the second. India's second largest Muslim population in one particular country. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Now, how about the places where Muslims live? Are there particular places, particular regions where Muslims live in, in India? And the Muslims are spread out throughout India, Alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. But the percentage, total population percentage, will be approximately 18% of the whole of India. But in certain states like Kerala, the population is more about 30 to 35 percent. Same with Hyderabad, more than 35 percent in Kashmir. And these pockets contain more percentage of Muslims as compared to the other parts of India. Of India. But Muslims are spread out alhamdulillah, throughout India. Throughout the country. Uh, how about the, the da'wah activities and these things in, in India? What are the, the major things in the da'wah activities in India? And Mashallah, alhamdulillah, there is a great scope for da'wah. And as far as our foundation is concerned, Islamic Research Foundation, we are trying a level best what we can to spread the message of Islam uh, to the non-Muslims. And for this, Alhamdulillah, we have got various other means. We distribute books and we have got a video cassette library. One of the most effective means is the cable TV network and the satellite channels. In Bombay alone, Alhamdulillah, every day we show our programs to more than 1.2 million homes for three hours every day. One in point India, 1.2 million, million homes. homes we show our Islamic Dawah programs mm -hmm. in Bombay alone, every day. Hardcore Dawah, talking about Quran, Hadith, quoting the Vedas, quoting the Bible, every day for three hours. I don't know of any other city in the world, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, which shows every day for three hours to 1.2 million homes. We have been very successful and we are doing this for the past approximately five to seven years, Alhamdulillah. Okay. Is that your own TV station or do you... Uh no, and somebody else's or you arrange with the uh, we TV produce station. the programs mm -hmm. and we give it to the cable operators and these cable operators majority of them are non-muslims mm -hmm. they're hindus but they like our programs so much initially we had to pay them through the programs mm -hmm. it became popular it became free now they are willing to pay us the hindus are willing to pay us money to on them alhamdulillah it's allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help that we're able to spread the message we have our internet facilities we have lectures regularly and the various other activities that we spread and we call the non-Muslims and we're opening gatherings where we have talks, they can ask us any questions 
they can ask any question on the Quran, on Islam, and we make them feel comfortable and they have an open session regularly at a foundation. Okay. Now the next question comes, Dr. Dakar, about the spread or the growth of Islam in India. How do you see it? Alhamdulillah, Islam spread far and wide in India. It's only after the partition that it became 180 million. Otherwise, previously, before partition, if you count the Muslims of Pakistan and Bangladesh and India put together, it will easily be about more than 450 million. So, mashallah, the growth is excellent. Mm -hmm. But after partition, the percentage has come down. And yet, alhamdulillah, there are many people accepting Islam. Or that Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, وَقُلْ جَعَلْ حَقْ وَثَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ When truth is halag in falsehood, falsehood perishes. Or falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Alhamdulillah, the non-Muslims, when they hear the logical aspect of Islam and the Quran, mashallah, you find many of them accepting and coming back to the truth. Okay, any statistics about the number of people, the number of non-Muslims accepting Islam in India each year? There's no particular figures that we have, but alhamdulillah, every day there are several accepting Islam in sure. Bombay as well as different parts of India. Okay. How about the, the problems that you encounter in doing your da'wah activities? Are there any problems that you encounter? Yes, but naturally, because we're living in a multicultural society, mm -hmm. we have to do da'wah with hikmah. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahil, chapter number 16, verse number 125, Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best most Christian. When we speak to the non-Muslims, we have to speak with them with hikmah, with love, with affection. We should not offend them. And I always use the verse of the Quran of Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, as the master key. It says, Ta'alaw ila qalmatin sawa'in bayni rabinakum. Come to common terms as we ascend you. So when we do da'wah with the non-Muslims, whether it be the Hindus in India or the Christians or the Jews, what we do, we talk about the commonalities in their scripture and our scripture. So that even if they don't agree with it, they cannot say it is wrong because then they'll have to say that the scripture is wrong. So this is one of the good techniques we use. And whenever we do da'wah, we quote the scriptures with references. So that it gives authenticity to our statement, not that we're pulling a fast one. And this really is appreciated by the non-Muslims because they themselves do not know what is mentioned in the scripture. So using this strategy, alhamdulillah, we are successful in conveying the message of Islam and the true message to the non-Muslims. Now, uh, Dr. Zakir, we all uh, heard about the recent massacre that had took place in uh, India. Well, what is the story behind it? Yes, the recent genocide that took place in Gujarat yes. about two months back. It is one of the worst massacres that has been seen in the century. I say it is much more worse than Palestine, much more worse than Bosnia. In the past two months alone, there were more than 10,000 Muslims who were killed. 10,000? More than 10,000. Though the official government figure puts it at 1,000. There are other organizations and statistics. But safely you can put the figure of more than 10,000 Muslims were killed, were butchered, were burnt alive. Oh. More than 10,000. Which, if you analyze, it is nothing but genocide. It was planned. It was pre-planned and it's mainly politically motivated. What I feel that the common Hindus in India, they're good people. They aren't against the Muslims. Mm -hmm. You know, we live with them. They don't have animosity against the Muslims. We live with them and we stay with them together. It is only a few Hindus who are mainly doing these things for political mileage. It's only a small group of Hindus who for their vote bank they're doing this. Otherwise, the common Hindu is good and we live harmoniously with them. So this small group of fanatics, they aren't actually practicing the religion because Hinduism doesn't say that you should kill the Muslims. Hinduism doesn't say that you should burn and you should rape and you should cause this loss. So they themselves aren't practicing Hindus, but they're using Hinduism as a card to get the vote back. And what happened in Gujarat, it was pre-planned. And if you analyze most of the human rights organizations, even the non-Muslim organizations, they say that this was pre-planned. It was meticulously planned in advance. And this incidence, though it was made to appear that it started because of a group of Hindus mm -hmm. being killed in a train in a place known as Godra, actually it was instigated, it was planned, that the Hindus themselves planned and they made such an act that they instigated the Muslims. They went on the railway station, they purchased things from the Muslims, didn't pay the hawkers, they pulled the beard of the Muslims and then they picked up a Muslim girl mm -hmm. and they tried to molest her. So, but naturally there was a reaction. 
and sure. this came even in New York Times, and even the non-Muslim papers they reported this, that it was a reaction. So, but naturally the Muslims got together and they attacked. Mm -hmm. Till that much time, it's a fact. But later on, suddenly, you find there's a fire in the compartment, and the report comes that 57 people have been burnt. Mm -hmm. All the Muslim organization in India, they said that we want an immediate inquiry, and the blame was put on the Muslims. What we say that the Muslims didn't do this. It was only made to appear so. Yes, the Muslims did attack, but the burning wasn't done by the Muslims. We don't know who did it, from where the fire came. Imagine there are four doors to the compartment, mm -hmm. and when fire is put, and from where the kerosene came, Allah alam. I mean, imagine none of the doors open. Yes. They say the doors were locked. You can't lock the door from outside. You have to lock the door from inside. Mm -hmm. So how can you say that the people who are getting burned, they themselves locked it from inside? So after this, immediately the next day there was a reaction and the massacre started. It wasn't a spontaneous riot that normally happens. Yes. It was pre-planned. They had paid people. They paid them daily wages. They paid the poor people to attack the Muslims. And they had all the statistics and figures where the Muslims lived. And hundreds and thousands of Muslim women were raped. And any Hindu who tried to help the Muslims, even they were attacked. There's an article which came in Times of India one of the reading papers of India, yes. that one Hindu woman tried to protect one of her Muslim friends, who was a girl. And she tried to prevent her from getting raped, even she was molested. So they made the message very clear that any Hindu who tries to protect the Muslim, they too will be killed. The unfortunate part of it is that though more than 10,000 Muslims were killed in about a span of two months, the international media hasn't at all portrayed it. Mm -hmm. The loss of the properties of Muslims is to a tune of 28,000 crore rupees. That goes to more than six billion dollars. It is much more than the loss in the 11th September direct loss. Yes. Or the twin towers coming down. The total loss of life is much more than Palestine. In the past one and a half to two years, the figures say that about 2,000 people were killed in Palestine. But here, in a span of just two days, more than 5,000 were killed. And in the span of more than two months, about more than 10,000 10, were killed. And the point that what we feel bad about it is that the material loss done to the Muslims, that inshallah the Muslims of India themselves can rehabilitate. Yes. The Indian Muslims living outside India, they are self alhamdulillah rich, they will support. What we really feel bad about it, that the Muslims throughout the world, the Muslim Ummah, no one has spoken about it. There is the Muslim community living outside India, they have been objected to this massacre. The Muslim countries, the Muslim organizations, what we wanted that at least the support should be there. Yes. Otherwise, you know, we find that the Muslim Ummah, the beloved Prophet said, that even if one part of the body, even the finger hurts, mm -hmm. the whole body is responsible and they should go and support, which hasn't been done in this case. Because actually the international media was made busy with the current issues in the Middle East particularly. Yes. And everybody is, is getting busy with these things. Yes, I do agree with yeah. you. Because I was in Jeddah, mm -hmm. and there when I spoke to the business community and the Saudi, they said, we were shocked. We thought maybe only 100 and 200 Muslims were killed. Mm -hmm. They were shocked when I told them that more than 10,000 Muslims were yeah, butchered and massacred. That's a very big number. More than 10,000. SubhanAllah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to relieve their families and uh, ask Allah to support them. Dr. Dakin, we concluded a previous episode about the Hinduism, which is the major religion in India. That's right. That the concept of God is, is one in Hinduism. Now, what is the source of difference between Muslims and Hindus in, in India? As I told you, if you go to the scripture, mm -hmm. authentic scriptures, we are common, as far as the concept of God is concerned. The difference, as I said, is in the practice. The Hindus say that everything is God, the tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the monkey is God, the snake is God. What we say, everything is God's. G-O-D with apostrophe S. Everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God, the human being belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God. So the major difference is, the Hindu says everything is God, we Muslims say everything is God's. G-O-D with apostrophe S. The major difference is apostrophe S. If we can solve the difference, we'll be one. Okay. So how does that affect the relationship between Muslims and Hindus? Anything in the daily life? Well, I feel, as I mentioned earlier, that I feel that the common Hindu and the common Muslim, I mean, there's no animosity between us. We may differ in certain aspects, but we support each other and we find that we live harmoniously. It is a few group of Hindus that they, for the vote bank, 
they do all these rites. Otherwise, the common Hindu, the majority, the majority, I mean, I don't think there is animosity. We do business together, we live together, and there's no problem, I feel. Okay. So the, the, the only source of problem is, is a few people, as you said. That's, that's what I feel. That's my opinion. Uh -huh. And the common Hindu, you have no problem with the common Hindu? Not at all. You have no problem? That's the reason. This time, when the massacre took place in Gujarat, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, the Hindu media, the non-Muslim media, they supported. They weren't biased, they were neutral, and they portrayed the right thing. So in the Indian media, in the newspapers, in the television, on the satellite, mashallah, they gave the true picture. And the majority of the Hindus, they objected to the government that what's happening is totally wrong, you should take action. But since they are in power, few groups of Hindus, who for the World Bank they are doing this, but the majority of the Hindus, they objected and they said what is being done is wrong and it should stop immediately. Okay. Dr. Dakar, how about the educational system there? Do you have your own Islamic schools or do your children go to the public schools or does the government <coughs> support the Islamic schools and Arabic schools in India? Yes, there are various types of schools, normal school with the government aided school is there. And you have the non-aided schools of the government run by different people, living by Christian missionaries, etc. Mm -hmm. Regarding Islamic school, just recently in the past couple of years, in Bombay alone, there were four Islamic schools that were started. Four Islamic schools. And one amongst them was started by our foundation, mm -hmm. the IRF Educational Trust. And Alhamdulillah, what we did, we started a school last year, and we intend having both the educations. People call it secular education, I don't call it secular. They say science, mathematics, geography, English is secular. But secular by definition means nothing to do with God. I don't call science as a secular education. I call it as a formal education. Because I feel science is an Islamic subject. Yes. Science proves the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I say we give both the education, the formal education, which includes English, mathematics, science, history, geography, as well as the Islamic education. And in our school, we have two mediums of instruction. The formal education is done in English and the Islamic education is done in Arabic. So we are teaching dual mirror of instruction right from age three when the child enters nursery. We teach when we teach English A for apple, B for ball, or A for Allah, B for Bismillah. Along with it we teach min alif asadun, min ba baitun, min ta tufahun. So that a child masters Arabic as a language, it becomes a mother tongue. Because to know Arabic is very important if you have to understand the Quran. It's a must. So it's a dual mean of instruction. And Alhamdulillah, even the formal education mm -hmm. of science and mathematics, we are trying to incorporate Islam into it. For example, when we teach about science, talk about the Big Bang, that when there was primary nebula, there was secondary separation, yes. which gave rise to the galaxy. We say this is already mentioned in the Quran, 1400 years back, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Awalam lazina kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arad, kaanat ratnum taknauma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we close them asunder. So in this way, we talk about biology in the Quran, zoology in the Quran, geology in the Quran, medicine in the Quran. So a Muslim is proud. And this, is, yeah, this further strengthens the belief of the young children that you That's teach. Right. teach. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward you for them. What, what are your future plans, Dr. Zakir, in the IRF, Islamic Research Foundation? What is your, your strategic plan? Our plan, alhamdulillah, that uh, we are expanding. We have, mashallah, full-time duas with us. Mm -hmm. We have plans of making a new complex. Inshallah, we want to increase activity. And at present, alhamdulillah, we are showing our programs on the satellite television channels to about 125 countries in the world every day for half an hour to one hour. We are covering most of the countries in Europe, most mm -hmm. of the countries in Africa, all the countries in the Middle East, all the countries in Asia, alhamdulillah. So you do it in English? Yes, English and Urdu about 75% to 80% in English mm -hmm. and about 20-25% in Urdu. Okay. And the targeted countries have an, an Urdu population, right? No. English and Urdu both. Okay. Like Europe is English. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's Europe, Africa, Asia and Middle East. Okay. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to support you and Amen. give you, grant you success in this. Uh, brothers and sisters, at the end of the program, I'd like to thank on behalf of you our guest for tonight, Dr. Dakar Abdul Karim Naik for being with us and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward him for his time and effort. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.